everyone. Peace, love, grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you out there. Before we begin, I just wanted to say thank you to the saints out there that are praying for this ministry. Thank you for all the comments, the emails, the letters, and even some phone calls. I look forward to our continued fellowship in Christ Jesus. And again, I appreciate all of your prayers. Also, you've probably been watching the news concerning this massive snowstorm that's heading this way. And I expect things that are probably going to get pretty interesting up here in northern Maine. So, once again, your prayers are certainly welcomed and appreciated. In our last study, we revisited the parable of the net. And if you remember, uh, it's probably more commonly known as the parable of the dragnet, the separation of the fish at the end of Daniel's 70th week, the angels who are separating the goat from the sheep, the goat being taken from the earth to judgment, and the sheep being ushered into the promised earthly kingdom. And in closing that study, I mentioned that we're gonna we would visit 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now specifically we're going to be answering the question, who are these unrighteous? Are they believers who, who are still practicing their sins? Or are they unbelievers lost in their sins? Is Paul telling them here that believers who still practice these things, when the rapture happens, are going to stay behind and they're going to have to go through Daniel's 70th week. They're not going to make it to heaven and so on. Is this proof that salvation is actually a works-based salvation. Is Paul telling us here in this verse that our works determine if we go to heaven or hell or if we're going to get caught up in the harpazo or if we're going to end up staying here for Daniel's 70th week. Now just like all of our studies we need to ask the questions of who, what, where, when, how, and why. It's all part of rightly dividing God's Word. Now Paul is writing this to the believers at Corinth okay and we need to understand who these Corinthians are to understand the context that we're going to be dealing with in this study looking back at Acts chapter 18 we see Paul arriving in a in the city of Corinth let's look at that together to get an overall picture of what's taking place in verse 1 after these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them, and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul pressed, was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. In verse 7, and he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now open, about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason with that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, 
Look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. And Paul, after this tarry, after this tarry there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centuria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. It's when Paul is in Ephesus that he writes this letter back to the Corinthian church. Paul is hearing and he's reading about all kinds of horrible things that are taken back in the city of Corinth. And this letter that Paul's writing is not a very friendly letter. It's actually a letter of, uh, it's not a letter of commendation. It's more of a letter of counseling. Now, for those of you who've ever been in the military, you know letters of counseling are not something that you look forward to getting in most situations. And Paul is not a happy camper with the believers at Corinth in this letter. Now, understand that the Corinthians were very much enveloped by pagan traditions. The majority of the population were Romans, Greeks, Gentiles, heathens, and they had an influx of Jews from the persecution at Rome. And these Jews were thrown out of Rome, and some of them moved into the city of Corinth. That's where we get the mixture of laws and the Gentiles being together, and it caused all kinds of confusion. Now, to get a good idea what Corinth was like, imagine the city of Las Vegas as a seaport. If you took the city of Las Vegas and you moved it just south of New York City, you'd have the city of Corinth. The city of Corinth was known for its worshiping of every false god that you can imagine. Gods like Aphrodite, uh, Hercules, the Queen of Heaven, Zeus and Apollo, and, and that's just a few of the, of the ones that they were worshiping, these little gods, the little G-gods, and idolatry was rampant. And it was going on all over that city of Corinth. Also, the city of Corinth was filled with all kinds of sinful professions. For example, prostitution was rampant. Uh, the prostitution business was huge. And much of their business came from the traveling sailors that entered this port city. It was a city of commerce. And when there's money, when there's lots of money, there's usually lots of debauchery. There, there was no doubt a fair share of drunkenness and thievery homosexuality adultery idol worship rivalries you know this place was the devil's playground okay so paul travels to corinth to first of all plead with his brethren the jews okay remember they got thrown out of rome and they ended up in the city of corinth and but you have to understand they were still under bondage the yoke of mosaic laws the Jews in Corinth were still very much uh, active in temple worship and for the most part they rejected Jesus as their Messiah. They denied him. So Paul's main objective here was to convince the unbelieving Jews that Jesus was in fact the Messiah prophesied in their scriptures. Okay, That's what he would do in the synagogue. He'd spend week after week after week in the synagogues going back through the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures that they had proving to them that the Messiah spoken of in the Old Testament was actually in truth this Jesus that they crucified on the cross that came first first Paul had to prove to them who Jesus was then after they believed in Jesus that he was the Messiah then Paul preached the gospel crucifixion burial and resurrection so Paul did lay the foundation of the gospel the gospel of grace while he was there at the port city of Corinth but when Paul left the Corinthians being babes in Christ Jesus being immature in the spirit put the gospel aside to fulfill the lust of their flesh and we see another example of believers leaving the gospel for something else in Galatians a different uh, a different example in Corinth we see that the problem was the flesh in Galatians we see that the problem is the law the Galatians were putting the gospel aside for the law, for religion, 
They preferred to follow the laws instead of believing solely on salvation by grace alone. The mystery that was revealed to Paul. Okay, so continuing on. So Paul gets wind that the foundation that he laid in Corinth was polluted with all this debauchery. And it was causing all kinds of problems. The, the Corinthians were clinging to their flesh versus clinging to the gospel truth. And it was running rampant within the body of Christ. And this angers Paul to no end. And here's the letter that he writes to address all these problems. In the first two verses, we see who's speaking here. It's Paul and who's being addressed. We look at 1 Corinthians uh, 6 verse or 1 first, first Corinthians 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother unto the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints that tells us right there who's Paul Paul is addressing believers these are saved members in the body of Christ continuing on called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ now reading on from chapter 1 through chapter 5 I'm gonna give you a very very basic overview uh, just to spare some time in this study so we don't have to we can move on here I encourage you to read that chapter in full and study those those chapters on your own all right we see Paul addressing the shameful debauchery taking place Paul addresses the division that uh, that all these things are causing and we see Paul offering cures on how to fix these problems right and Paul gets really specific with all the problems that they're having and and then he gets again very specific on how to handle these problems from fornication to lawsuits and so on and so on in fact, we see Paul's intention behind this letter sent to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, uh, we see it. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Okay, he's talking about this first letter that he sent. And here he admits that it was a very uh, chastising letter, if you will. Though I did not repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry though it were but for a season now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry but that ye sorrow to repentance for ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of but the sorrow of the world worketh death so what we just read reveals Paul's intentions behind the first letter to expose the Corinthian sinful lifestyles within the church and Paul warns them to change or else to repent of their ways to, to turn around to make a 180 away from those things and to grow in the spirit right now let's look at chapter 6 and get the context leading up to the study here today first Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1 dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world and if the world should be judged by you are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters know ye not that we shall judge angels how much more things that, that pertain to this life if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church I speak to your shame is it so that there is not a wise man among you no not one that should be able to judge between his brethren but brother goeth to law with brother and and that before the unbelievers now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because ye go to law with one another why do ye not rather take wrong why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded nay Ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but 
ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So this takes us back full circle to the original question. Who are the unrighteous here in verse 9? Now, in order to understand what Paul means when he uses the word unrighteous, we need to dig a little bit deeper and study this out, okay? Unrighteous here is, in fact, the Greek word atikos, and it means to be unjust, wicked, sinful, deceitful, treacherous. In verse in 1 Corinthians 6, 1, we see an example of this word being used again, atikos. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust. That's the unjust here is the word atikos. It's the same word, unrighteous, okay? And not before the saints. In Acts 24, 15, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. The word unjust here is the same root word, atikos. And again, we can use the word unrighteous, okay? It's the, uh, the same Greek word can mean unjust, unrighteous, wicked, sinful, and so on. Now in Rome, uh, Romans 3, 5, but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous? Again, here's that word, unrighteous, atikos, who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. Now, we see other examples of the word unrighteous used in other places, but it's uh, there's a different root word to those words, okay? And I'm going to show you a, a bit of the difference here. They have different meanings. That's why we need to study to show ourselves approved. We need to study these things out, right? 2 Corinthians 6.14 But ye not unequally, I'm sorry, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what conquered hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now in verse 14, we see that word, unrighteousness. But the, uh, the, uh, the root word of this situation of unrighteous here is a different word. It is anomia. It is not adikos. In this situation, it is anomia, and it means something different. It's a feminine noun, which it is. it refers to the law, okay? Uh, to be illegal, illegality, uh, violations of the law, or wickedness, iniquity, transgressions of the law, unrighteousness. Okay, so we see two different words, atikos and omia. Well, Paul is using the word uh, atikos in our study today in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Now, if you look at 1 John 3, 4, we see this different word, unrighteousness, uh, if you recall, it's anomia, and we're going to see examples of that being used here, and it refers to being unlawful, okay? It has to do with the law, transgression against the laws. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth, and we see this word here, transgresseth, is another way, another word used alongside unrighteousness, and the Greek root word of that here in G458 is the word anomia, also the law, okay, for sin is the transgression of the law in hebrews 10 17 and their sins and iniquities iniquities here is the same root word going back to anomia will i remember no more so as i said earlier the corinthians had problems with the flesh right and the galatians had problems with the law placing themselves back under bondage trying to work for their salvation now in the book of galatians look at what paul says here in galatians 5 21 and look at the similarities to our verse that we're studying. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, 
that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Very, very similar to the verse we're studying today. Notice this word do, okay? In Galatians 5.21, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, Paul lists out various sinful lifestyles that will not inherit the kingdom of God. We need, we need to look at this word do here, right, in Galatians, because it's very significant to the context of what Paul is saying back in 1 Corinthians 6. This word do refers, in, in, in Galatians 5.21, the word do translates to present tense, continual practicing a, a uh, currently enveloped uh, to practice consumed with an activity current participation an active situation current obsession obsessive actions compulsive activity so simply it's being involved with an activity without any future plans to stop it is your lifestyle okay and, or you, you want you know you're not thinking about repenting of this you're consumed by these different sinful lifestyles. That's what the word do here in the Greek means. It, it means to be totally consumed in a certain sinful, uh, obsessive type of activity that, you're, that you have no plans whatsoever to ever leave in the future unless our Lord God changes that for you. Okay, Something that does not affect, uh, it doesn't affect your conscience in either direction. Now, in Galatians 5.21, that word do again is, we look at it, exercise, practice, to be busy with, to carry on, to undertake, to, to, uh, to do, to accomplish, to perform, to commit, perpetrate, and so on. The primary, it's a primary verb, and it means to practice, perform repeatedly, habitually, all right? So, it, by implication, it, it's to execute, it is to accomplish, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, in Romans 1.32, we see the use of this Greek word here, okay? Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit. Commit is the, is the same thing as the word do here, okay? Such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Okay, here we see again this word do. The Greek word uh, G4238, and it goes back the Greek word of prasso, all right? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but. So in Romans 2, 1, therefore thou art in inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest, here's that word, that root word again, prasso or prasso, the same things. Romans 2, 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit. There again, here's that same root word that means do, to be involved with, obsessive, something that you're practicing, okay? You can even think of it of a, as, a, as a practicing occultist or a Satanist or someone that or is a professional prostitute, okay? These people are just living out their sinful, their wickedness, and they have no no thoughts whatsoever to leave those things, right? Romans 2, 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do, again, here's that word do, such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Okay? Going back to 1 Corinthians 6, 9, the unrighteous that Paul is speaking about here are people without salvation. These people are lost. People on the outside of the body of Christ. These unrighteous are people who are dead in their sins. Look at 1 Corinthians 6.11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In Ephesians 2, look at this in verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in, your, in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So, in closing, number one, Paul is addressing believers in this letter 
He's speaking to the church at Corinth, the body of Christ. Number two, the unrighteous here are non-believers. These people are not saved and they don't plan to be saved. People not in the body of Christ, people who belong to the world system. Paul is rebuking the Corinthians because of their tendencies to give in to the flesh, their desires of sin, okay, and acting foolish and causing problems. Simply, he's telling them to grow up, to start, to start acting in the spirit instead of acting in the flesh all the time. Their, their spiritual immaturity was causing all kinds of problems for them. It was dividing the believers at Corinth, and Paul is telling them why there's so many problems going on, and he's also trying to address it and fix it. Also, the second conversation between Paul and the body of Christ at Corinth is the fact that the Corinthians were taking their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to court lawsuits and then being judged by non-believers taking church matters to the world instead of dealing with these issues themselves and Paul tells the body of uh, a body of Christ at Corinth that they had more authority over themselves than the lost world did Paul tells them don't you know that you the body of Christ will be the ones judging the world even judging the angels yet you continue to let the world judge you instead you see first Corinthians 6 in verse 4 if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life set them the judge who are least esteemed in the church I speak to your shame is it so that there is not a wise man among you no not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren you see Paul is trying to get them to understand just who they were in Christ Jesus and he tells them don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God then why do you let them judge your matters you see that's the context and Paul says you guys are the true judges not them not the unrighteous unsafe people of the world Paul says judge yourselves and stop letting these church matters be judged by the lost because the Corinthians were living in the flesh they were looking to the flesh to solve their problems even in legal matters and lawsuits and so on now lastly we've seen how rightly dividing uh, studying God's Word out taking the time to study certain words and phrases can lead to a whole new meaning than what we first thought in 2 Timothy 2 15 study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth studying and reading are two different things you can read the book of Galatians in less than an hour but studying the book of Galatians can take an entire year Paul says to study to show thyself approved now I assume I assume most of you watching this had at some time in your life uh, have some education whether it be high school or college you know there's a difference between studying and reading right in fact let's look at the definition of the word study to fix the mind closely upon a subject to muse to dwell upon thought to apply the mind to to read and examine for the purpose of learning and understanding as to study law or theology to study languages to consider attentively to examine closely now lastly we need to talk about the word grace for a minute I've noticed that there's so much confusion sur surrounding this word grace which in itself is very sim simple and should be kept simple but people like to confuse things that's just our nature right in is grace a license to sin absolutely not take a look at my videos on the judgment seat of Christ I have two of them please go look at those if you don't understand if grace is a license to sin or not take a look at the judgment seat of Christ videos that I have on my channel those who say grace is a license to sin obviously have haven't read God's Word rightly divided that's obvious there is a time of judgment for all believers to be judged on both good and bad good and bad things that we do will come up again in the future you can read about that second Corinthians 5 verse 10 for we must all all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be what good or bad first Corinthians 3 in verse 12 through 15 now if any man build upon this foundation gold silver precious stones wood hay stubble every man's work shall be made manifest 
for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire in Romans 14 but why dost thou judge thy brother or why dost thou set at naught thy brother for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ for it is written as I live saith the Lord every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God our beloved Apostle Paul is clearly telling us to be very 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 careful how we live our lives as members of the body of Christ because we will be answering for both good and the bad things that we do prior to the judgment seat of Christ and when the rapture happens it's too late for you to go back and change those things my friends it'll be too late once the rapture happens you're gonna be before the judgment seat of Christ faster than you can say judgment seat of Christ nowhere in God's Word does it say grace is a license to sin it's not found that's something to really really think about my friends if you look back at Galatians 5 after Paul talks about all the sinfulness of the flesh then Paul tells us how we should be acting look at verse 4 uh, 22 Galatians 5 22 but the fruit of the Spirit is love joy peace long-suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such there is no law and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust if we live in the Spirit let us also walk in the Spirit let us not be desirous of vainglory provoking one another envying one another amen so with that we just covered 1st Corinthians 6 verse 9 and the unrighteous here are not unrighteous believers in the body of Christ the unrighteous that Paul is mentioning are people outside of the body of Christ and the context here is that Paul is asking them why they are letting unrighteous people judge the matters within the body of Christ Paul tells them you guys need to be judging and you guys need to be fixing your own problems stop looking at the world to solve your problems these those guys are unrighteous they're not going to heaven they're not inheriting the heaven the heavenly places like you are so forget about those people they have nothing to do with you guys you guys deal with it so the unrighteous again has nothing to do with us the body of Christ or at the time of Corinth it had to do with people outside of the body all right thanks for studying with me Saints Lord willing, I will see you on the next video.